welcome everybody online if you're listening in your car or watching the hotel room and obviously everybody in this room, our guests and uh, people have been tracking us for a while. We're in a series uh, called The Jesus Way and if you fall asleep halfway through this message or you fall asleep and you wake up all of a sudden and you thought, oh, I just had the best nap ever, then there's some good news because uh, we're going to look at a story today and Jesus fell asleep halfway through our story. And uh, another good piece of uh, news is if you fall asleep and you wake up, you can always go to our website at pathwayschurch.us and uh, you can listen to the message again. And maybe, (laughs) just maybe, you might find yourself uh, with another nap in your near future. So uh, check that out. No, no, seriously, lots of great information online and love for you to be a part of that. Also, a great way to connect with us is through uh, this study guide. And so if you have a study guide, hundreds of you have picked one of these up. Love for you to get one of these in your hands. Got the information, grab one of these. Great resource. If you're part of a small group or you're in a Bible study, you can use some of these questions and resources. Or you can use them in your own personal kind of quiet space and reflect upon some of the messages and scriptures. Lots of resources in there. Now, Uh, The reason that we're doing this series called The Jesus Way, here's the whole purpose. The reason that we're doing this series is because uh, we want to be more like Jesus, not simply to know more about Jesus. And uh, last week we made a startling discovery. Here's what we learned. If this doesn't make sense, you're going to have to go back and listen to last week's message. But here's what we learned about The Jesus Way. The Jesus Way is not a demand, it's an invitation. The Jesus way is not a demand. Jesus is not saying this. He is saying this. He's inviting us to follow him. And if you remember, we talked about Peter and Andrew and James and John, these fishermen who had followed Jesus. But Jesus just didn't invite people like fishermen. He invited other people. A guy by the name of, uh, for example, a guy by the name of Levi. Now, Levi later became known as one of the apostles whose name was Matthew. And Levi was a tax collector. And, and tax collectors in the first century, they were the scum of the earth. And here's why. They were Jews who were employed by the Romans to go and to collect taxes from their own countrymen, their own countrywomen, and to take those taxes and to give them back to Caesar. But here's what the tax collectors did. They would hike up the percentage, and then they would skim off the top, put that additional funds for their personal benefit into their pockets, and if Rome got what they wanted, the tax collectors could get what they want. Now, here's the thing. The Jews knew that the tax collectors were doing that, and they thought to themselves, how can you do that to your own people? Well, one day, Jesus saw Levi, he was at a tax collector's booth, and he said, Levi, hey, Levi, how about you come and you follow me? And Levi's like, what? Don't you know that I'm a tax collector? And so uh, he followed Jesus, and, and Levi said, you know, this is so cool. Jesus, I would love, I would love for you to come to my house tonight. We're having just like a, a party. So Jesus shows up at, at Matthew's house, and there's like a DJ and music and tons of food. And it's not only just him, Levi, is a tax collector, but all these other tax collectors are gathered around the table. Not only that, but Mark's gospel tells us that there's sinners there as well. Now, it doesn't say what kind of sinners they were, but, but these were people who, who didn't typically hang around rabbis, people like Jesus. So Jesus is eating with sinners, and, and some of the Pharisees, I mean, this is just blowing their mind. They're thinking to themselves, how could, they couldn't get their minds wrapped around this. So they said to Jesus' disciples, like, why is he eating with sinners? Jesus overhears this, and this is what he says in Mark chapter 2. Jesus says, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. See, uh, one of the other key important things that we learned last week is that, that just because you're a sinner, just because you're a sinner, being a sinner doesn't disqualify you from following Jesus. In fact, it's a prerequisite. The only people that Jesus ever invited to follow him were sinners. And the people who followed Jesus, very few of them, very, very few of them actually followed Jesus. I wish I could go into this, maybe a message for another time. The people who actually followed Jesus, very, very few of them followed Jesus because he was the son of God. They didn't follow him because they thought he was the son of God. Do you know why they followed him? They followed him because he healed them, because he taught them, and because he fed them. I mean, who wouldn't follow a guy that feeds you, right? 
That's why they followed him. Now, here's the thing. If you say yes to following Jesus, if you choose to follow Jesus and you say yes to him, or if you've been following Jesus for any period of time, then you know that your relationship with Jesus is not a safeguard to uncertainty. If you follow Jesus, it's not a pain-free, problem-free kind of life. In fact, if you've been following Jesus for any length of time in this room, how many of you would say, amen? Amen. Yeah, come on. Sound like a Baptist church right there. Wow, okay. Yeah. But one of the distinguishing things as Christ followers, one of the things that should set us apart is how we respond, how you and I respond to uncertainty. In fact, if you're not a God follower, you're not a Christian, you're not a believer here today, and you've ever noticed a Christian who responds to uncertainty differently than than normal human beings, then today what you're going to discover is that difference. And the difference that we're going to talk about is the Jesus way as related to uncertainty and fear. Because uncertainty is unavoidable, but fear, being fearful, is optional. And, And here's what's just Here's what's so ironic about today's message. This message is more for me than anybody else in this room. In fact, if you knew how much I battled fear, anxious thoughts, how much my mind just spun out of it, just, it just goes and goes. This message, in fact, if you knew how much, you'd be surprised and you probably wouldn't come back next week. This message around what we're going to look at, the Jesus way, when it comes to fear and uncertainty, this is so powerful. So if you have a Bible, paper, mobile, go with me to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. If you're in the study guide, it's on page 20. Mark chapter 4. And let me set the scene for you. So here's the scene. In uh, Mark chapter 3, one chapter earlier, Jesus, he's in a church service. He's in the synagogue, and uh, it's on Sabbath, and he heals a guy with a shriveled hand. His hand's all messed up, and Jesus heals him. Now, this apparently is a no-no to take place in the synagogue on Sabbath. Why? Because on the Sabbath, you weren't supposed to work. And in that culture, what it meant to participate in healing activities, Jesus would take, or a healer would take spices and herbs, they would grind them up, or they would mix the oils, and then they would apply those uh, ingredients to those who were sick. And so those healing activities were considered work, and that work was restricted on the Sabbath. But here's what's interesting. If you read in chapter 3, Jesus doesn't grind anything or mix anything. Jesus just simply speaks to the person, to the guy with the messed up hand. He just simply says, stretch out your hand. So technically, Jesus doesn't break the the Levitical law. Now, uh, that's not my point in this. Here's my point. Here's my point. Chapter 3, verse 6, here's what uh, takes place. Once he performs this miracle, uh, then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. What I want you to see is that early on, very early on, in Jesus' efforts to, to spread God's message, his hope, and his love, he experiences opposition. Chapter 3. Chapter 3, uh, Mark is 16 chapters, so very early on, by chapter 3, they're already talking about how they're going to kill Jesus. You know what the takeaway is for you and me? The takeaway is this, that every time you begin to follow Jesus, you can expect to experience opposition. That's just though every time you begin to step up in your walk, in your relationship with God, every time you want to, to accomplish God's work in our world and you want his love and his power to pass through you, you can expect to experience opposition. So verse 7, uh, Jesus, he goes away and he seeks solitude with the Father. He prays to God. He pours out his heart. And then something interesting takes place in verse 8. Let's look at it together. Verse 8, it says this. When they had heard about all that he was doing, many people, say many people, people. came to him, came to Jesus from Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea and the regions across the Jordan and also around Tyre and Sidon. So all these people heard what Jesus was doing, from healing a guy in the synagogue to uh, showing up at Peter mo- Peter's mother-in-law's house and healing all the people around Capernaum and all through Bethsaida. They were all gathering around, and they were traveling from these regions, regions uh, near the Jordan River, from Idumea and Jerusalem and Judea and Tyre and Sidon. Now, you might ask yourself, where are these regions? Well, first, let me show you the world in the New Testament. 
There is the Mediterranean Sea, and there's Italy. If you go around the rim, Italy, Greece, Turkey, Syria, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. Now, the life and ministry of Jesus, here are the regions that Mark 3, 8 just spoke of. If you zoom in and you look at Israel, Israel is divided into three different sections. There's Galilee in the north, Samaria in the, in the mid-region, and then Judea. Now, in uh, verse 8, it says that many people, when they heard these things, they traveled from certain locations. So they came from this region, the southern portion in Judea. They came from Jerusalem, which was the holy city. And then uh, it also says they, come, they came from Idumea. And Idumea is down here. It just cut off. We couldn't get it up a little bit. Idumea is right here. Idumea is uh, the land that was granted by God to Esau in the Old Testament. You can read about it in Genesis chapter uh, 32. It's for the, for the Edomites, okay? And Edomia was a, a, a very mountainous uh, kind of terrain. They didn't have like Ford 150s or RBs. And so when people from Edomia traveled up to the Sea of Galilee, they just packed up on donkeys and, 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 and started out on the way. In fact, this was about 90 miles to the Sea of Galilee. Here are the regions. Uh, there's the Jordan River. That, that black vein right there, so the regions uh, near the Jordan. And then if you go up in the northwest corner, there's Tyre and Sidon is even further north. It's about a 45-mile trek down to the Sea of Galilee. So all of these people are now curious about this teacher. He's healing people. Word is spreading. They're coming all around from uh, all these different parts, and they're collecting at, at, at Jesus' next series of messages. So chapter 4, it opens up and Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God. He's talking about the kingdom and he's referencing that the kingdom of God is like. And then he uses these things called parables. These gritty, earthy stories that people can relate to. He's not talking like lofty theology in big $3 terms. He's talking like where they live. He says the kingdom of God is like, like a sower that takes seed and he scatters it on these different soils. And people are like, oh, that kind of makes sense. And he talks about uh, how it's like a, 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 the kingdom of God is like a, it's like a, it's like a tree. He uses these different parables. And at the end of chapter 4, after a long day of teaching, Jesus, he invites his disciples uh, to get something uh, to, to eat. That evening, they have a meal together. And then uh, he says to his disciples, hey, guys, let's go across. Let's cross over the Sea of Galilee. So this is where we pick up the story in verse 36. Verse 36, leaving the crowd behind, they, the disciples, took him, Jesus, along, just as he was in the boat. And then there's this little line at the end, there were also other boats with him. Now, uh, in the first century, this is a typical, this is what a boat would look like. So we have an image of a boat. Uh, this was dubbed the Jesus boat. Archaeologists found this on the, on the, on the shores of the, of, of, of the Sea of Galilee, and uh, they called it the Jesus boat. Not that Jesus necessarily sailed in this boat, but it's during the time when Jesus would have lived and walked uh, planet Earth. It's about uh, 27 feet long and uh, carried about 15 passengers. So imagine for a moment that Jesus, after he has this long day of teaching, he says to his disciples, okay, we just, we just got some food, and um, I'd love for you to, to, to take a boat ride with me. I mean, how cool would it be to go on a boat ride with Jesus, right? Jesus says, hey, why don't you come on a boat ride with me? Now, here's the power of of the boat. The, the boat communicates something very significant. The boat communicates that, that there is deep fellowship and relationship with Jesus. Notice Jesus didn't say to the crowds, hey, crowds, everybody go, get, get your boat, or your, you know, get your little whatever you got, and let's cross the sea together. Jesus says to his disciples, how about you leave the crowds and let's get into the boat together? It signifies this deep and intimate relationship with Jesus. Now, last week we uh, asked, I posed a question to you, what do you need to leave in order to follow Jesus? What do you need to leave behind in order to follow Jesus? Uh, specifically, the disciples had to leave the crowds. 
Sometimes we have to leave the applause of other people. Sometimes we have to leave successful things. you got to remember, these were just common and ordinary young teenage boys who perhaps were picking up the family trade being fishermen or maybe, you know, kind of like scum in the earth, tax collectors. And this was their moment. The rabbi had called unto them, follow me, and now their crowds are just gathering around this rabbi, and they're with the rabbi. It's like they're a part of the, they're, they're in, they're on the in. But they had to leave the crowds behind in order to get in the boat with Jesus. So I can imagine that they're pretty, you know, wow, how cool is this, you know, a couple hundred, maybe a thousand, two thousand people are gathered around. Jesus goes through all these talks in chapter four, and then he says, Hey, let's go to the other side. And they're thinking to themselves, Oh, yes, he's speaking to me. We'll see you. See you crowds. We're getting into the boat. Must have been like kind of that, that epic scene. You know how sometimes you watch a documentary of like, like, a, like a rock band, and they all just like get out of the concert hall and jump into the limo and they just go away. In my mind's eye, it's something like this. They're all in the boat and they're going over. And here's what the disciples don't realize. They don't know the next verse. They don't know verse 37. Listen to what verse 37 says. Verse 37 says, an isolated shower came up. A, a, a furious squall. When was the last time you used the word squall, by the way? Squall. A furious squall came up. They're getting into the boat thinking, oh, this is awesome. High five. Jesus just, man, he just, he just killed that message. Now let's get in the boat. We're, we had some dinner together. We're going to go cruise over to the other side. It's going to be just an amazing evening. What a boat ride with Jesus. They don't realize that verse 37 says, a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat. Broke over to the boat so much so that it was nearly swamped. They didn't realize verse 37 was going to take place. That a massive squall, a furious squall, storm was going to kick up. And, and, and just let me remind you that these are some experienced fishermen. I mean, they've been on the Sea of Galilee. Peter and, and James and John, they had a family business, James and John, sons of Zebedee. They, kind of, they had the Zebedee fishing business. They knew the trade. The squall kicks up. The water is going over the sides of the boat, and it was nearly swamped. The thing was going to capsize. And to compound the problem, not only are they in the boat, but, but night is falling. In fact, maybe, maybe the storm looks something like this. There was a storm that was brewing and hovering, and they're in the waves, and the rocks are there, and they're on this 27-foot-long boat. Did you see any lights on that? Did you see any radio correspondence? Nobody had iPhones. They couldn't just like, hey, hey, mayday, mayday. It's like, no, oh, water's coming over. That thing is going to spin over. Have you ever been in one of these moments in your life? Evening, night is falling, there's no lights on your boat, you feel all alone, you're thinking to yourself, man, this thing, I'm going to go down. This thing is going to capsize. Do you, know, do you know some of those storms? The storm when you're feeling like, oh my word, this is so overwhelming, I'm not sure if there's a way out. I don't know. That with all of my wisdom and all my ingenuity and all my money and all of my resources and all of my experience, if I can make it out of this storm. You know what those storms are like? You ever been in this? Maybe you're in a storm just like that today. Maybe you're thinking to yourself, there is no way I can get out of this storm. So what do the disciples do? They would do what we would do. They freaked out. Look at uh, verse uh, 38 this is interesting. Here's what they do. Uh, Jesus, oh, first, <laughs> this is where Jesus takes a nap. Uh, halfway through the story, uh, Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. I love that Mark throws in the idea that he was on a cushion. That just, that just, that's great, right? He's not just sleeping in the boat. He's actually sleeping on a cushion, okay? So Jesus is sleeping on the cushion, and, and the disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, 
Don't you care if we drown? Don't you care if we drown? You know what the disciples did? The first thing that they did, they panicked. Don't we panic? When one of these raging storms around our lives, when we feel like everything is out of control, the first thing that we do, we're looking, we panic, we freak out. And the second thing that they do is they question Jesus. They wake him up, they woke him up because they were so panicked, and then they questioned Jesus. Do you know why they questioned him? Because they thought that Jesus was indifferent toward their situation. They thought that there was a level of indifference toward, toward, toward their storm. Have you ever been in a storm and you're asking Jesus, hey, where are you? Don't you care about me? Don't you see what I'm going through? And you think that God is so far off. You think that he is so distant. And, and every time you try to pray, you just feel like your prayers are hitting the, the ceiling and bouncing back. And you wonder to yourself, there is no way, Jesus, my boat is going to capsize. Capsize. Do you know what the disciples forgot? You know what they forgot? They forgot whose boat they were in. They forgot that the idea to even cross over the Sea of Galilee did not belong to them, that it was Jesus' idea, and that Jesus was in the boat. It was Jesus' boat. Sometimes I think you and I, we forget whose boat we're in. In fact, if you read the story, it's so interesting that there were other boats that were out there. I wonder what those boats were. I wonder what those boats consisted of. Maybe they had some other fishing companies that were out on the boat, or a couple of the crowd, the, the onlookers, wanted to cruise on with Jesus, and so they followed him. But whatever boat they were in, they weren't in the boat with Jesus. The question that we have to ask ourselves when we're dealing with uncertainty and we're dealing with anxiety and we're, we're facing the storms of life, the question that we need to ask is, whose boat are you in? Whose boat are you in? Because if you're not in the Jesus boat, friends, the percentage of your, of your boat just capsizing and your life just running amok is much higher than if you're in Jesus' boat. Whose boat are you in? Are you in the boat of your parents? I'm in the boat of my parents. I'm in my ex's boat. If she would come back, if he would come back, everything would be fine. You're placing your hopes in the boat of your ex. Are you in the boss's boat? Maybe you're in the pleasure boat, the addiction boat. Maybe you're in the boat of your pride, the pride boat. You think you have it all figured out and you understand everything and everything on the outside looks good and, and, and you're just on a roll right now and you're in the pride boat. Can I tell you that there will be a time in life that you're going to face a furious squall, a storm that is beyond your control and capability and you're going to look around and you're going to ask yourself, man, whose boat am I in? So uh, Jesus is sleeping and they wake him up and and. And here's what takes place. Uh, Jesus gets up and he just speaks to the storm. He just says, hey, quiet, quiet. And the storm just, it just vanishes. Waves stop. I can imagine that the thunder just, and all of a sudden the moon comes out. It's a beautiful, crystal clear evening. And the disciples are like, oh my word. Jesus turns to Peter. He's like, hey, Peter, can I get a Diet Coke? He's like, no, nah, he didn't say that, but that's how I imagine. He just woke up from a nap. You know what we're talking about today? We're talking about faith and fear. We're talking about the uncertainties of life. We're talking about the times when, when, when it just doesn't make sense to you and, 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 and you're just so anxious and overwhelmed because the water's coming in your boat. But it's not your boat. Boat belongs to Jesus. You know, uh, it's kind of interesting because um, the next verse, uh, look at verse 40. <laughs> So Jesus said to his disciples, I love this question, why are you so afraid? I love that question. 
Jesus doesn't say, why are you afraid? Jesus doesn't say to his disciples, you shouldn't be afraid. He acknowledges that fear is a part of our existence. Like, we're going to be afraid in life. We're going to deal with the storms. We're, there are going to be times when anxiety just, that is natural part of life. What Jesus is saying is, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? In my mind, what Jesus is saying, he is saying, why are you so afraid? Why do you have no faith? See, what Jesus wants from you and I and the relationship and the life that he gives us is not the removal of fear. It's not, it's not like you're going to live a problem for your pain for your but Listen, that's never going to happen. There's always going to be levels of anxiety and fear that you're going to deal with in life. What Jesus wants to give you is an increasing level of faith so that when fear hits, your faith always rises above your internal fears. And many of us live like this. Sometimes we live like this. Jesus wants the level of your faith to be stronger than your level of fear. Uncertainty is unavoidable, but being fearful is optional. So here's what I want you to do. You're listening today and you're thinking, okay, that's, that's great. But Adam, tell me, like, what, what are my takeaways? Here's what I want you to do. If you're battling fear, or ang- if you're anxious, if you're anxious, you deal with anxiety. Of, I mean, you know, here's, I want you to ask yourself a question. Write this down. Here's the question I want you to ask. What's the worst possible outcome? What's the worst possible outcome of my situation that I'm facing right now? You're in a storm, and you're, you're asking yourself, what is the worst possible outcome? Well, the worst possible outcome is that I can lose my job. Well, can I tell you that Jesus knew you and loved you before you had that job? Well, the worst possible outcome is that that's not going to get delivered, and it's going to be delayed, and it's going to push my agenda and my schedule back, and my boss might be mad. Do you know what? God still loves you. He's still on the, he's still on the throne. He's still in control. Do you know that your worst possible outcome, it doesn't throw Jesus off? Because if you're in the Jesus boat and he's taking a nap during your worst storm, don't misinterpret that as his indifference toward your storm. Interpret that as his complete and utter control and sovereignty over your situation. And when he wakes up and he speaks to your storm, you can rest assured that it has no power or bearing over your future. That's the kind of God that we serve. He is in complete and utter control. So what you need to do is just ask yourself, what's the worst possible outcome? And just, and just list that out, just line that up. Well, if that would happen, that would mean this. That, that would mean this. You know what it's going to do? It's going to help you to release all that. And you're going to put that on paper, and then you just, you know what you do? You just show that to Jesus. So when, you, when, you, when you're talking to him, or you're sensing him, or you just say, Jesus, here, 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 are, the, here are my worst possible outcomes. Would you help me? And then I want you to memorize this verse. I want you to embed this verse into your chest cavity. I want you to take this in. If you struggle with fear or anxiety, if you're dealing with a storm right now in your life, uh, Psalm 56.3 is the verse that I want you to memorize. Here it is. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In fact, can we, can we just say that together? Let's say it together. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. Do you know what the Jesus way is when it comes to uncertainty and fear? The Jesus way, the Jesus way, the life that he invites you and me to experience is simply this. That it takes our fears and it turns them into absolute trust. The Jesus way turns fear into absolute trust. 
Everything that you're battling, all the storms that you're going through, all the pressures in life, when you turn that into greater amounts of trust in God, God is perfecting you and he's making you more like Jesus. And that's the reason we're talking about Jesus. Not to know more about him, but to be more like him. Let's pray. So God, we're just here today as human beings, some of us who are facing some of the most anxious-filled moments of our lives. Some of us are riddled with fear and battling and struggling against the storm that's raging around us and in us. And so today, Jesus, we just, we need your help. God, I pray for my friends today who, who need to sit down and get into a circle or spend some time in, in just their chair and just reflecting and, and pouring out their heart to you. God, I pray that Psalm 56.3 will be a verse for many people in this area. God, because you just want to increase our faith and our level of faith to grow in proportion to the internal fears or the external fears that we're facing. And God, I also pray for some who might be listening online or perhaps in this room today that, that if they were to be honest with themselves and ask themselves the question, the boat that they're in is not your boat. It doesn't belong to you. God, I pray that you would just speak to their hearts in the next few moments. And if you're here or listening today and you know you're not in the Jesus boat, if you want to make that decision today, if you want to make the choice to get out of your boat and to step into Jesus' boat, that he's the captain of your boat, regardless of what you're facing today, if you want to face it with him, then I want you to say this prayer quietly and softly at your seat. Jesus, you see my life, and I've been sailing around in the wrong boat, and today I acknowledge that the, the storms of life, the pain of life, and the sin of my own heart has kept me in my boat far from your boat. And today, I just, I want to get into your boat. I don't want to do life alone. I'm tired of my boat. I'm tired of me trying to figure this out and do it on my own. And while I might look successful, while I might have things together, while, while I can fake out the crowd, God, I know when I stand and sit in front of you, my creator, it just, my heart aches. I'm in the wrong boat. So Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me of my pride. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of my deepest failures. I pray that your love and your mercy, your grace, would meet me in this moment. That your river of love and mercy would cover my, my sin. Thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. God, I receive your new life for my old life. I receive this by faith. In Jesus' name. Now, God, for the rest of us, Lord, as we go from this place, God, help us to go in the power and the spirit of who you are, Jesus. We want to walk the Jesus way. We pray this in your name. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for being here this weekend. If you made a decision for Christ or you need prayer, please stop by this cross. If you're new, I'd love to meet you over at this cross. God bless you. We'll see you next weekend.